Welcome to episode 43 of the Gamboss Podcast. I'm your host, Eric, and this is my co-host. On this week's episode, Christian watched Veronica Mars Season 4. Christian also watched the Amazon series The Boys. I'm going to talk about Bloodstain Ritual of the Night. And finally, we'll end with our Amazon review game. But first, Christian, you watched Veronica Mars Season 4. Now, you talked a little bit about this uh, at the end of the episode last week. Uh, what What is Veronica Mars? Uh, so the the show in general is about a high school girl who works with her dad as a PI in like an uber wealthy California beach town. Season four is more focused around a serial bomber that has started blowing stuff up around town and she and her dad get hired to find him. Um, the, the show originally started in 2004 and it ran for three years. Uh, then there was a movie at some point in there, and now season four just premiered uh, of like a month or so ago, and so all the characters are grown up. It's been fifteen years, and uh, it's pretty cool. It was it was a nice return to the series. So that's interesting. I think it's a good idea for them to address a time change because it'd be so weird if it's been what uh, twelve or you said fifteen years at this point. If they just tried to go back and act like these people were um, were that same age, do they have a large portion of the cast returning yeah a big chunk of them there were some noticeable absences especially mac who is always one of my favorite characters she doesn't come back but almost everybody else does in one capacity or another some some people who were main characters before uh only become bit parts some people just have little cameos here and there Uh, but in one way or another almost the entire staff comes back I was especially excited to see Max Greenfield, who plays Schmidt in New Girl. He was originally on Veronica Morris uh, back in 2004. And so that was it was cool to see him come back as uh, like an FBI agent. Now, are there any other uh, big name actors part of Veronica Mars? In in this season? Yeah. So there's Patton Oswalt comes in as a like a major character this season. So that was cool to see. I really like him. Um the other new main character is Maddie, who's played by Isabella Vidovic. And I, like, I, I've i seen her in a couple things. She was in the movie Wonder, which came out, I think, late last year. And and she does a really good job in this. She she played a, a pretty fun character. Cool. Um, so you briefly touched on the plot being about a serial bomber. Do you want to go into a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's... There's a, a hotel that gets blown up, and they one of the people that is killed is a, a Mexican national with ties to, like, a cartel. So there are a couple of, like, cartel hitmen up from Mexico to try and find the the person who killed their boss's like, nephew or stepson or something. Uh, so it's it's partially following them. One of the people that gets killed is a congressman's brother so it's uh partially following the the congressman's campaign and uh and his life and then uh one of the people is that girl's dad who ran ran the hotel so it's partially following her so there's a couple different plot lines that all get interwoven through this through this bombing and then as other bombings start happening the uh the mars family gets brought on to help find the person responsible so you you, did you overall enjoy this yeah, I did. It was like I said, it was a good return to the series. It uh it it lost a little bit of something. I mean, maybe not lost, but it it felt different since like everyone was out of high school and a lot of the character dynamics had changed and I did it, it I mean, it's been 15 years since the show started, 12 years since the show ended, so it's a lot has changed both like in in the actors' lives and in the characters' lives. So it was a whole new dynamic, but it still managed to maintain a lot of the, a lot of the charm and a lot of the like uh, overall mood and tone of the original series, which was fun. It was nice. Uh, do you prefer the original series over this one, or do you like season four? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard to compare them because they're they're so different. Like the stakes are so much different. But uh, yeah, I, I do think I like the originals more just because. I, w- I would have been 14 when the first one came out, so like I didn't necessarily grow up with it, but I, I watched it a long time ago, and it- I-, I-, I really, really enjoyed it, so it's it's nostalgic for me. It- th- this was more just, it was fun to like check in with the characters more than anything else. 
and the season does leave a lot unresolved and kind of open ended, um, but not in a way that that teases another season. I don't think there are any real plans to have a season five. It's just kind of like a like a real life kind of situation where like you don't always get a happy ending, you don't always get a closure in in every single aspect of the story. It's like sometimes things just stop without any real resolution and so it's it's not clunky or anything it's it just it feels it feels realistic did veronica and mars have like a cult following is that why this was renewed yeah kind of it 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 was popular when it first came out season three wasn't super good and so i think a lot of people jumped ship and it never got renewed um they tried to kind of revive it like i said there was a movie a few years back and the movie was pretty good too if i'm I, I don't remember a whole lot of it because I only watched it once. Uh, I know I own it on DVD. I've been meaning to go back and watch it. Um, but yeah, it definitely had a, a pretty strong cult fan base. That I know there were a lot of people that were really excited to to see it come back, even the cast included. Uh, so looking, checking out Rotten Tomatoes because I, I feel like that's the easiest thing I have for TV right now. It looks like critics look like it is sitting at an 89%, but the audience score is 27%. Or is, is that surprising you? Uh, yeah, I mean, kind of, so I think this kind of reflects what I was saying about a lot of things are left unresolved. The ending is a little abrupt, at least one aspect of it. So I could see how a lot of people could maybe walk away from it feeling kind of not, not super pleased. I mean, I... I wasn't super pleased in the ending, just that I didn't like how it ended. Not necessarily that it was like done poorly. It's just, it was an emotional ending. And so I could definitely see fans kind of taking out their feelings on the, on the review board. I definitely lean, lean more towards the 89 than the, the 27. That's 27 is so low. It's that's, it does definitely does not deserve that. Yeah. The way you're talking about it, I'm surprised. Normally you don't see TV shows that low, especially ones that got renewed years after the fact. Even, even though I didn't particularly like Arrested Development Season 4, uh, I don't even think that would have been rated that low. I would not rate it that low, little personally. Yeah. Um, so where can you watch this at? It is on Hulu, as are all the other seasons. It, it was never on anything until about... Uh, three months ago and i guess since hulu was the one putting out the new season they bought up the rights and and released the first three seasons as well so yeah i I know i had mentioned on a couple previous episodes that i'd been going back and rewatching the the veronica mars and it was basically just to get ready for season four how is christian bell on this i I really like her in the good place uh and i i actually don't know very much as she's she's in usually she's good i Yes, yeah, I mean she was a major draw for the original series. I, I think she plays the character really, really well. She's uh, she's similar to how she is in The Good Place, but a little less obnoxious. She's just kind of snarky and in, in like a, a fun kind of playful way. Um, but yeah, she's she's great in this. She, she slipped right back into that character without much trouble. So, would you recommend our audience check this one out? Yeah, for sure. Definitely don't believe the twenty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. That's crazy. Uh if you're a if you're a fan of the old show, I would definitely check this out. In the past couple weeks, Amazon has released a show that has been getting a lot of buzz on the internet, The Boys. Christian, you got a chance to check this one out. What did you think of it? Oof. This show's a lot. It's yeah, it's <laughs> it's a lot to take in. <laughs> it's really really funny in places. It's really really serious in places, and it's really really messed up basically the entire time. Uh, so, what is the basic premise of this? So, it's another reimagining of superheroes, which, if I'm being honest, is getting a little stale. Like I've I've seen every. I've seen every version of a superhero movie I think they can possibly make. I've seen good superheroes and bad superheroes and grumpy superheroes and whatever else. So I I wasn't super excited for this going in, even though it was getting a lot of good publicity, just because I was kind of tired of it. And honestly, this is probably the most realistic depiction of superheroes I've ever seen, which is kind of a huge bummer. (laughs) 
Uh, why is that? Everyone in this show is a disaster. Like, the actors are incredible. They play these characters really, really well. But the characters themselves are disasters. Like, just, just as much as any real person is. Like, none of them are motivated by, like, a singular goodness. Like, none of them are Superman. They, they don't approach the world with, like, a fundamental morality. They're just people with powers. And so they're all motivated by, like, conflicting opinions. And they all have these inner conflicts that more often than not lead them to not make very good choices. And so it's it just leaves you kind it it leaves you feeling kind of bleak. Now in in this universe, are there a lot of superheroes, or or is it you know a smaller amount? Like in I I, I guess the Justice League you could say has a lot of superheroes, but really compared to like the world's population, it's not very many. Uh, is this like a common occurrence, or is it still pretty rare? Uh yeah, I I think it's probably closer to like a DC universe where there are a bunch of them. But there's only a couple, like, really big-time ones. And it, it, there's really not a lot, like you said, compared to the entire population of the world. It's it's generally rare, but there's still, like, a bunch. The show is kind of careful never to really reveal how common superheroes actually are. And so how do they frame this, then? Uh, do they follow a team or, or what? They kind of follow two teams. They follow, really, two chief protagonists. Uh, there's Yui, whose girlfriend was accidentally murdered by a superhero named A-Train right at the start. And so he joins like an anti-supers hit team to try and get revenge. Uh, at first, just on A-Train, and then as he falls into the, the role kind of on everyone, like all superheroes. And then there's Annie, who is a superhero named Starlight, who's the newest member of a group called The Seven. And they're like the seven best superheroes in the world. They're completely controlled by a private corporation. Uh, I'm guessing that has some conflicts of interest to it. <laughs> yeah, so basically everything that the Seven does, or everything that the Seven do is like super choreographed, and it's all done with like branding in mind so that this co company can like sell an image and then sell merchandise for the, the heroes that they have in their employ. Dude, have you ever seen Mystery Men? Yeah. It reminds me, and I can't remember Captain Awesome or whoever, like, the, the main superhero is that gets <laughs> captured. He has, yeah. like, he, he, like, rips the Pepsi sponsor off in, like, the first five minutes. <laughs> like, shoot, man, that, that movie was ahead of its time on superhero commentary. <laughs> it's It very much is like that, except it's not goofy. It's, like, it's, <laughs> it's real dark. Like, everybody, every single character in this movie is insanely corrupt. Like, there are no, like, there are no, like, real good guys in this movie. Everybody is doing everything for terrible motivations. Uh, so, are there any uh, bigger name actors, and did any of them do a particularly good job? There's a few. Um, well, for, first of all, like, this, this was written in, uh, and produced by Seth Rogen and, I believe, Evan Goldberg. It was one of their projects. Um, they're not in it. Kurt uh, Carl Urban plays Billy Butcher. He's the leader of the like the anti superhero resistance team, and he absolutely kills it. He makes a meal out of every scene he is in. He's so good. Like he's one of my favorite actors just in general. Like from Lord of the Rings onward, I've always been a big fan of Carl Urban, uh, and he is so good as Billy Butcher in this. And uh, Elizabeth Shue is in. She's a, a non superhero. But she's like the corporate leader of the superhero team. So she's the one that's always managing them and like telling them where to be and when to be there and how to act when they get there. And so she does a, a really good job of being kind of like the soulless uh, corporate executive. But the, the real leader of the seven is a character named Homelander. And he's, he's supposed to be like kind of a mashup between Captain America and Superman. And uh, yeah, he's oof. he is a intense character. What do you mean by that? He's just <laughs> there's a lot to Homelander. Like for for the first several episodes, probably two or three episodes, because I watched this basically in one sitting. Like, so I have trouble parsing the episodes. Um, <laughs> yeah. But for the first maybe quarter of the show, you're left wondering if Homelander is a good guy 
or if he's like everybody else like is he the like the beacon of goodness that everybody thinks he is or is he like all the others because all the other superheroes are shown basically from the jump to be terrible but you're you like you're left wondering about homeland like i thought maybe he was a robot for a little while like he's he's a very strange character and when they when they finally start like unwrapping his layers like it, it gets it gets pretty intense um, so I'm checking this out on Rotten Tomatoes. It looks like this is pretty popular. It has an 82% critic score and a 94% audience score. Uh, do you agree with those, or do you think it should be low or better? That doesn't surprise me. Honestly, like, I'm not 100% sure how I feel about this show. Like, I watched it a few weeks ago, and like I said, I watched it in basically one go, and I'm still digesting it. It's It gets pretty rough in places. Like, there is a lot of dark stuff in this show. I'd probably put it like maybe high seventies. There, there's some stuff that doesn't really make sense, or it like it it doesn't really go anywhere. But it it is a show that is begging for a season two. Like it it ends on a tremendous cliffhanger. Yeah, I always think it's hard to like rate a to rate a television series as well because it's so long and there can be really good episodes and just. Some episodes can be slog, so uh, so you can check this out on Amazon. Would you recommend our our audience check it out? Honestly, it's gonna depend very heavily on the person. Like, if you don't mind a lot of like graphic violence, then yeah, you, like you'll probably be into this because it does get pretty graphic, both in in violence and sexuality. But like, if <laughs> if you're if you have more intense like sensibilities i guess definitely you're gonna want to steer clear of this one because it is not going to be your cup of tea a couple weeks ago i platinum the game bloodstain ritual of the night now this is a game produced by koji igarashi who is most known for doing a lot of the castlevania games especially Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and this is basically a spiritual successor to those games. Yeah, I'm, I've been wanting to, to grab this one because Symphony of the Night is was one of my favorite games growing up. Yeah, man, I, I've never played Symphony of the Night, but after playing this, I would like to check it out. Um, a little bit of background on my experience with games like this. I've tried to get into Metroidvania-style games a couple of times, and if you guys don't know what a Metroidvania game is... It basically it combines elements from Castlevania Symphony of the Night and elements of Super Metroid on the Super Nintendo. And you're a two-dimensional character going across the screen, doing damage with weapons and then upgrading and getting new movement abilities to explore more of a map. And it's a very exploratory-based uh, game uh, with enemies in there. So I've tried to over the years because they sound fun, and I never could. I played Hollow Knight. I played Axiom Verge, and those two games I just could not get into, uh, even though they had hugely popular, um, like a huge, huge following. But I, I just couldn't get into them for whatever reason. And this is the game that did it for me. I love this game. Awesome. Uh, so a little bit of background on this game. It actually started out as a Kickstarter. And, you know, there have been a lot of uh, Kickstarter failures and there have been there have been a few successes uh most notably i think pillars of eternity was very popular but uh, a couple years ago we got mighty number no. nine which was made as a spiritual successor to mega man uh, and it was made by the original guy who worked on mega man and that game was a dumpster fire and no one really liked it so a lot of people uh, had trepidation about this game uh in one of its i think it was the beta that was released a couple months before it came out it got skewered for its graphics because they were, I guess, very muddy. And instead of just doubling down on it, the studio actually took to heart the criticisms and released a bizarre trailer. But it was the trailer that made me be like, I kind of want to play this game where it opens with Igarashi, the guy who's making the game, sitting in like a, kind of like a throne drinking wine, but it's made to look like blood because you know, he's a vampire or whatever. And you just start seeing like uh, negative comments about the game popping up on the screen and him being like, you don't think we can do better? And then they go to like a split screen of the old game versus the new game. And they revamped so much of the graphics. I thought it looked way better. Like this game's really pretty. It's it's so good looking. And 
like having the I guess wherewithal on the day of the internet where you can get skewered for ignoring fans. Like I I think that generated a lot of goodwill to show like hey we are listening to what the community wants and so far this game I think this game has done pretty well sales wise. That's a pretty cool way to handle it. Yeah, I I was surprised and I probably wouldn't have got the game if I didn't see it because again like I never got hooked on Metroidvanias but I like that idea and you know it looked cool. Um, so the basic story on this one is not much to write home about. You're basically playing a character who can absorb these shards that are dropped by demons when you kill them uh and she gains their powers and then the more she absorbs the more like a demon she becomes and so her old friend uh who also has that power eventually resurrects a castle from the demon world and a bunch of demons are released into the world so you need to go and explore the castle to essentially destroy it and send it back uh to the other world I think pretty basic stuff, especially if you've played like Castlevania games before. I think that's basically the story to all of them, except they say it's Dracula's castle that appears. <laughs> um, and so when you're going through the game, you have real, it is really similar to Castlevania. You have your normal attack, which in the Castlevania series was like a whip or a sword, but this one you have a ton of weapon variety. You have heavy weapons, you have daggers, you can get like martial art boots, so you're kicking people. And all most of the weapons have like a combo that you can do if you find a, a secret book in the castle that tells you how to do it, or maybe you can look it up online. I never, I never actually looked into that. It uses a little bit of your magic meter up, but it does give a lot of variety to the weapons. And there are, I would guess, around a hundred weapons, if not more. Like there are a ton of them. Oh wow. And on top of the normal items you get, you then get the shards from killing enemies, and they give you special powers. So they essentially work as like the flail or the like holy water in Castlevania, but there are I think ninety some shards that you collect. I can't remember the exact number. Some of them are active, where you know you hit triangle and you'll shoot, um, like you'll create paintings that come around you like a shield. Other ones are directional. You can uh, where you will have a blade come out of your hand and it damages anywhere in the area of effect, but then it's constantly draining your magic meter. Other ones are augments, so it's like a passive ability where you have higher resistance to poison or something like that. And so you can really customize your character in this game, which I liked, and they allow you to do shortcuts so you can create different builds for different things you need because you need these abilities to actually traverse the world like you can... Uh, basically turn into light and bounce off a bunch of mirrors and then appear somewhere else to get through smaller areas or, you know, you have your double jump. Uh, one of the abilities you get that's pretty cool is you invert the world. So it, it, it that helps with traversal and it really changes playing around certain areas. Yeah, this sounds pretty cool. Like, it, it definitely sounds similar. Like I, I mean, I know this is the whole point, but, like, it definitely sounds like a Castlevania game, which I'm super into. Yeah, I hope... I hope they make more of these because I I really thought this game was fun. I mean, I, I never have really played the Castlevania series. I played like one on an emulator on the NES and it was okay. But, you know, I was playing it in 2015 at that point. So I, I'm used to modern gameplay. Uh, but I will say a highlight of this game is I really enjoyed the boss battles and all of them unlocked generally a new power that would help you uh, in some way. And they, they're challenging, you know. I died a couple of times before I could figure out patterns or a lot of these or, or change out my build to help me with them because, man, like, they have patterns. You can take damage very quickly in this game unless you're, like, out there grinding uh, for levels or finding extra health, like, hidden throughout the world. And and I, re I really enjoyed it. I don't think they are too hard. They didn't overstay their welcome like, uh, like games sometimes can with hard bass bottles. <laughs> Yeah. But there were a couple in this game that uh, of the hidden ones that were legitimately challenging that I, I had to wait till the end of the game to try again because um, even if you knew the patterns, like sometimes I couldn't react as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that does lead me to one of my annoyances about the game is at the very beginning, you physically as a character just move very slowly. <laughs> one of my biggest pet peeves in games is I just do not like moving slowly. I understand why they do it in this game. It makes sense. And then as you 
uh, level up and progress through the game, you get some shards that allow you to move quicker, which I put on immediately, and you get like books <laughs> that'll help you move quicker. And then finally, at the end, if you win a race, you get like a special power that basically lets you run through the level. So when you're at the end of the game, it is nice to have that option. And you're still not just moving at a snail's pace. Yeah, hey, like I definitely feel you there because we we had talked before we started recording briefly about I've been playing Assassin's Creed two and. Man, some of the missions where you have to sneak around and like stay hidden inside a group of people and just walk and walk and walk and all I want to do is do like the free running and climbing and uh, it, it's it's frustrating. Oh, I, that's that is my biggest pet peeve in a, like in a gaming is moving slow just for the purpose of moving slow. Assassin's Creed were horrible at it. I hated the following missions in those games. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I mean, maybe I'm just bad at it, but the. the the follow missions that I've been getting, the the people I'm following don't walk at any pace that I can replicate. The, no, that... the paces the paces I can walk are either too fast by a little bit or too slow by a little bit. And so they either like I have to keep like run for a second, walk for a second, run for a second, and I, oh, it's it's aggravating. I know, man. That is such a that is such a weakness of a lot of PS3 games is it's either follow missions or missions where you're waiting for like a companion to talk to you while you move and they don't move at the speed you do. So you're like sprinting ahead of them Mm -hmm. and then you just have to stand there and wait. It makes no sense why if you're like, okay, we're going to be doing this move at the same pace. It it's a bad, (laughs) it's bad game design. Yeah. Like I, I know I, I've played a few games, uh, horizon zero dawn has it where the, the character that is with you will match whatever pace that you're moving at. And I've had games where you have to match their pace, but it's possible. Like you Mm -hmm. just have to find the right speed to walk. But yeah, definitely in Assassin's Creed 2, you cannot match the speed of the people that you're walking with. And it's so frustrating. Yeah. Big pet peeve. (laughs) Well, I'm definitely looking forward to to checking this game out. Like I I think it's 40 bucks on, on the PlayStation store. I just looked and I can get Symphony of the Night in a, a bundle with one of the other Castlevania games for 20 so I'm, I'm probably going to do that at some point too. Yeah, I heard that was a good one. I don't know if it's based on the PS1 version or the PSP port, uh, but I think the other game you get is maybe Rondo of Blood. I think it was a Genesis game, but again, I might yeah, be wrong. I, I I heard it was good. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I also looked up while we were talking here and the... Uh, one of my favorite parts of Symphony of the Night was the music, and the composer for Symphony of the Night is is also the composer for Bloodstain. It's uh, Michiro Yamane, and uh, I have the Symphony of the Night soundtrack on my computer, and I, I listen to it still kind of regularly. I, I really, really enjoyed the music from that. So since this is the same composer, that's that's even a, another plus for me. Yeah, I, I like the music in this one. I very rarely notice music in games anymore. It has to be a real standout. Like, the Final Fantasy style tracks still stick in my mind. Mm -hmm. um but otherwise i haven't noticed but i did like this i it's a lot of like the castle music and i think what happened to me was and this is my second problem with the game was when i was going for the platinum it's a nice short game i got to the ending area in about 12 hours you know it didn't overstay its welcome it was fun and then for the next 12 hours to platinum you need to complete the bestiary get all the shards and then one of my biggest problems you have to craft everything which involves a lot of grinding, and they do make grinding easy. If you can find where an enemy is, kill them, and run off screen and back, you can you can chain enemies very quickly. But the problem is, it just takes a really long time to do all that and it, and collect tons of money. You basically have to... I ended up just looking for a guide online of how to make a lot of money quickly, which involves upgrading the proper shards for gold and stuff that are kind of out of the way that you want to look. So it just... The last 12 hours of the game kind of wore me down, uh, but I did love the first 12 hours, and I love the final boss battles and the secret battles, so those were really cool. Um, so if you're going for the Platinum, just heads up that it will involve grinding, unfortunately. Ugh, that's too bad. Overall, though, I would highly recommend this game. Uh, if I had to give it a rating, I'd say it's a high B. Like I think this is one of the best games in its genre, uh, I don't know if I'd say it's one of the best games on the P- like a, a must play game on the PS4 because I know some people aren't going to like the Metroidvania John uh, like that that style of game, but it's it's real close. I have a hard time not putting it up there. 
Uh, but I I know like the game itself might turn some people off. But if anyone has even a passing interest in the Castlevania series, I would highly suggest checking this one out. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna have to try and play a couple more of these because I think Castlevania Symphony of the Night's the only like Metroidvania game I've ever played. So I can't even say if I'm a fan of the genre or just that game in particular. <laughs> That's that's true. Chris. I'd see. I've never played Super Metroid um, on the NES, and for whatever reason, I couldn't get into any of them. So maybe I just do like this style of game because I like being able to level up. Like it's part of it's like an action RPG kind of. Like you level up, you can level up shards and all that stuff. And I like those aspects, mm-hmm. and I and I like exploring the levels. And once you can move around quickly and everything, it it is really fun. So yeah, maybe it is just this style of game that I like the the Castlevania style. <laughs> All right, since we have a little bit of time, I just want to talk real briefly about a Netflix documentary I watched last night. It was called Jim and Andy of the Great Beyond. It is um, it is a documentary about... It's a documentary starring Jim Carrey, and they're discussing his role as Andy Kaufman in Man on the Moon. And it's interesting, if you really like that movie, it's good for one reason, and... And that's because during the filming of Man on the Moon, Jim Carrey basically hired a camera crew to follow him around, I don't know, 24 hours a day and take all of this footage that has just been sitting in a a storage room that he owns for the past 20 years. So you see a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And so I've, I've not actually seen Man on the Moon, but I have heard stories about it. And basically Jim Carrey went into full acting mode 24 seven as being uh andy kaufman or one of andy kaufman's characters whose whose name escapes me i can't remember it uh and he seems like he would have been horrible to work with because he (laughs) will not respond to jim he's like i'll tell jim that later and the one of the characters he plays is like an alcoholic jerk who is just horrible to everyone and I just, I could not believe some of the stuff he was doing. Like, I did not seem like it would have been fun to work on that set. The the documentary tries to play it off that, like, everyone loved working there, but I, I don't know. I thought it looked like a nightmare to work at. Yeah, that sounds not very fun. Yeah, so primarily why I wanted to check this out was um, I listened to uh, a bit of a podcast that the wrestler Jerry Lawler was on, and he did a bit with Andy Kaufman back in the day where he, they wrestled each other, so they got him for the actual movie itself. And Lala, well, the way Lawler was talking, he couldn't stand Jim, stand Jim Carrey because he said him and Andy were like actually friends, but then behind this, then Jim Carrey was just a jerk to him all the time, egging him on, trying to get him to powerbomb him for the movie, and eventually like Lawler snapped and went to attack him, and Jim Carrey like hammed it up that he was injured and stuff. And it's, I, I don't think he enjoyed being part of that movie. Um, but just the behind the scenes stuff on it is crazy. Like I cannot imagine doing that all the time. And Jim Carrey try, I feel like he tries to be real introspective about it. He's like, I I had to do it. The way he started saying he did it was he got the call on a beach. He saw a pod of dolphins and then the spirit of Andy Kaufman just took over him. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, Jim might have been mad, but that's what Andy wanted to do. Like, any bad behavior he had, he seemed to blame on Andy Kaufman's spirit overtaking him. Uh, oh, that's so weird. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> After watching this documentary, I actually like Jim Carrey less. I think he's <laughs> I think he's kind of insane. It also was brought to my attention that he's anti-vax, which, you know, yeah. I lose any, a, a lot of respect for that there, too. So... <laughs> Yeah, I've yeah, I've been all over the map with Jim Carrey when yeah when I found out he was an anti-vax person I was like mm, I don't I don't know about this uh, yeah the, this mm, yeah I should probably watch this because he does sound like a lunatic yeah and it's weird. like I like some of his early stuff and it, it, and it's actually partly a documentary about Jim Carrey too like you find out about his past a little bit and all that and a little bit about the movies he did after because after. I mean, he, he I think he might have won an Oscar for this one. He won some awards for this one. And after he did, like, his big comedy stints, he, he be, started to become, like, a more serious actor. Like, Eternal Sunshine was really good in, like, a serious movie. 
Uh, I heard this one's very good. I just never watched it. Well, I mean, if if everything pans out, he's still going to be the villain in the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. You're tr- moving back to his roots. He's going to be Dr. <laughs> Robotnik. Well, he was in Kick-Ass 2 and then yeah. told no one to go see it because there was too much violence in it, <laughs> which made no sense to me. I didn't, I, mean, I didn't see it because I heard it was really bad, but... <laughs> That was like crazy to me that he would do that. Like, why join it in the first place? You did you not read the script <laughs> or see the first one? <laughs> right? Like, so I don't. Very, I don't know. Very weird guy. Yeah i i I don't think I'm a Jim Carrey fan, but it it is I think worth checking out if you like that movie, just because you will see a lot of the behind the scene footage of Jim Carrey acting like these characters in all situations of filming. If I was the director, I would have killed him because the director had to be like, please just do this for me. It would be a huge, you know, huge favor, like trying to like talk to egos and stuff. And it was, it was crazy. I don't know how people could work on this movie. Mm. And now it's time for our Amazon review game. Just a quick recap. I have picked three five-star reviews for a movie on Amazon. I will read one of the reviews to Christian, and he will get a chance to ask two yes or no questions to help him narrow it down. He can then ask for a second review, ask two yes or no questions. Uh, He can ask for a third review, ask two more, and then he has to put in a final guess. This year, we are keeping score, so if he gets it on the first movie, he gets three points. Second movie, two points. Third movie, one point. Christian, are you ready? I am ready. I know there are already a ton of reviews on this movie, but I just had to put in my two cents. I loved it. It was one of the most hilarious movies I have ever seen, although I can see some of my friends and family being a bit put off by it. Basically, this star is one of the most ignorant characters I have ever seen. Sometimes I see a movie or a I see a character that is just so stupid that it's not even funny, but somehow this works. To give you a comparison, if any of you have seen Dumb and Dumber, they would be near geniuses compared to this character. At least they knew that a toilet at least they knew that a toilet was where you do your business. I laughed so hard so many times that my abs actually got a bit of a workout. If you have a good sense of humor and are not offended easily, you will love this movie. Oh my god. All I can think of is the fake movie Simple Jack from Tropic Thunder. <laughs> no, no, that that one bombed. <laughs> uh, did this movie come out in the last five years? No. Does this movie star Steve Carell? No. Yeah, then I'm going to need another review. Sasha Cohen oh, is God. a brilliant comedian and has more guts than any warrior. This is a hilarious comedy that did not have a script for the most part. It makes an ass out of the most narrow-minded, bloodthirsty, and cult-like culture that has dominated half of America for close to three centuries and currently is at its height. Oh, well, that narrowed it right down. Uh, I've got, I think, two choices. Is it Borat? It is Borat. Ah, ooh. Ooh, what a bad movie. You don't like Borat? Oh, no, I do not like Borat. Really? I don't I've, think I've liked any of his movies. I love Borat when it came out. I don't think it still holds up, but at the time, I died in theaters for that movie. Yeah, I I mean, mm, I go back and forth with that. And I, I watched Bruno, and I remembered hating Bruno. I did not particularly care for Bruno. I thought, like, this that stick had passed by that time, because I was, like, what, late 2000s? They also had yeah. The Dictator, which was also, I heard, horrible. I... I like The Dictator more than I like Bruno. It has one specific line in it that I use a lot, which is Crocs are the universal sign of a man who's given up hope. I I think that line's really funny. Uh, The rest of the movie I could kind of leave. Yeah, I I didn't didn't much care for Borat. What if I totally just threw a trick at you and it was actually Le Miz? (laughs) (laughs) You know, as I was saying it, I thought to myself, I thought basically that exact thought, like, what if this is Le Miserable? I'd be so unhappy. <laughs> Who finds that movie that funny? <laughs> Alright guys, thanks for checking out our episode. Before we head out, Christian, what are you going to be checking out this week? Uh, well, like I said, I've been playing Assassin's Creed and Final Fantasy X, so I'm, I'm uh, 
I'm probably going to be slogging through those a little bit. Ready or Not comes out in theaters this week, which looks pretty interesting. It's uh, It looks kind of like a riff on Cabin in the Woods, where these people have to kind of play a game, but the game ends in like a lot of murder as, as like a sacrifice to something. Uh, it's <laughs> the, the previous little vague, but it looks like it could be fun. Um, I got pretty behind on movies, but I was looking at what we have at our theater, and honestly... I don't really care to get caught up on a lot of them. Uh, like Angry Birds 2 came out, which I'm probably going to skip. And 47 Meters Down 2 came out, which I'm probably going to skip. Um, so yeah, it's probably just going to be some reading and some uh, some video games for the most part. Did you see Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark? I did not. Okay, I'm just curious. I, I'm like sort of interested in that one but i don't think i'm going to make, if i make it to the movies i'm seeing dora and the lost city of gold since you recommended it so highly and then saw it the second time i'm probably like one of our friends was on vacation when we went and saw it on friday and like we talked it up real big to her so we might go watch it for a third time when she gets home this week <laughs> yeah so uh this week I, i'm not doing much i'm going to be out of town again this weekend which is kind of annoying because that, that's when i usually do a lot of stuff uh, last week I I've been trying to read more. So last week I finished Paper Towns, which was like not, it wasn't a bad book. I don't, I I don't have enough to say on it to actually review it though. Uh, currently reading Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, and I like that one a lot more than I thought I would. Hmm. And I'm listening to an audio book called The Girl on the Train or something. It's also not bad, but uh, not well. I guess what I was expecting. It was described to me as like a Gone Girl style book, and, and maybe it gets to that. And I'm just too early, and I don't know. Oh yeah, that uh, it might be by the same author. They they made a movie of that one too, I think. Yeah, I I, I saw that. That's part of why. Yeah, I, I I did not see the movie though, so we'll see how how it goes. I have like nine hours left on. I've been listening to it to that work and back. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I've just been watching One Piece. I need to yeah figure out a movie I think to watch for next week. So uh, I'll, I'll try and figure that out later, but. Basically, just trying to read. Haven't not been able to play video games. My uh, where my game console is has been taken over for other stuff right now, so I have not been able to to play any video games for uh, over a week now. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for checking out our episode. If you would like to give a suggestion for the Amazon review game, or just you know send out uh, any questions or comments in general, we are at Gambots Network on Twitter, or you can research. Or you can reach us at gambots.blog at gmail.com. Otherwise, if you guys enjoy the show, please try and rate uh, please try and rate it on whatever platform you're listening to. Uh, otherwise, thanks for listening, guys. Thank you.